Welcome back to HR and HQ. At least that's where I am. My friend and colleague, Sarah Obad, we just up the road. But most importantly, we're talking Breeders' Cup. This one's an international edition. And Sarah, more than any other race here in the States, race day here in the States, the international flavor of the Breeders' Cup. I uh, don't want to say center stage necessarily, but definitely always one of the big storylines of this event. Well, that's part of the draw, right? You have uh, yeah. horses competing from all over the world, and that's why it is called those end-of-the-year world championships. Mm -hmm. So it's not just us. We get to see some of the talent from other countries, too. And I think that's one of the great things about the uh, Challenge Series, too, is that you have races for horses that are overseas, are in different parts of the world that can get that win and you're in and have the incentive to come over and compete versus the uh, locally based horses. So it's an exciting um, flair to the Breeders' Cup. Uh, we normally associate sort of the, the heavy hitters of the international contingent with the turf races, but last year we did see uh, an upset on the main track in the distaff with the Japanese invader Marsh Lorraine. Uh, and of course, uh, they also won the Philly and Mare turf with, it's it, In Love is the local one, uh, Love's Only You? Yep. That was yep. it, Love's Only You, yes. Uh, Enable a few years ago at Churchill Downs being the first ARC Breeders' Cup turf winner in the same year. Exciting, we list dozens of uh, excellent international stars. It feels like this year, though, um, some years you sort of get the big name like in an Enable. Other years you just sort of get a bunch of European invaders. And it seems like we're in the latter category this year. Maybe Modern Games, which is a no name, but he, he did lose his last race. So we're lacking the Enable, but certainly some depth to this group. Well, I think Modern Games is a uh, horse of notoriety, certainly after what happened last year with the running for purse money only incident that uh, any of us that have been paying attention to this sport for quite some time will obviously never forget what happened there. So um, I kind of wonder if it'll be a, a good omen or perhaps an ominous one when he returns to the uh, to the States and uh, hopefully you get to bet on him this time as well as everybody else. Right. Or bet against them and have it count is uh, the ultimate uh, arbiter. But uh, yeah, Modern Games seem to me the, the most recognizable name, although his trainer, uh, Charles Appleby, certainly uh, not really a stranger through the years. But what he's done here in the States the last year, year and a half or so, uh, has garnered a lot of attention. And that brings me to how you approach uh, sort of distilling all these European contenders. Now, we'll have the pre-entries released next Wednesday, uh, October 26th. So that seems to sort of be that line where you actually kind of see who's expected for the fields and preferences and things like that. And admittedly, that's really when it begins in earnest. We're just kind of talking here. But what is your approach for seeing how the internationals fit with the horses you're more familiar with? Well, I watched your preview earlier today with David Levitch, the Paddock Prince, about um, basically how the Keeneland meet is going since he's having such a great meet, as well as you asking him the same question. And I would say that my first instinct is not um, not like his answer or yours, because the first thing I do when I pull up the PPs for any sort of international horse that has run several times is I want to see if they have left-handed experience. So... Obviously, anybody that has been following the game for some time knows that in other countries and other tracks, you can run a right-handed turn, you can run on a straightaway. There's all sorts of different course configurations. And here in the U.S., um, other than Kentucky Downs having a specialty course configuration, you are always running left-handed even there as well. So I want to see if they have that left-handed experience because I think um, that really can play into the way that a horse is balanced, having to run in one direction only changes up where their strengths are and weaknesses are in their body. So I want to see if they have the ability to do that um, more naturally than others that are trying it for the first time. And I think it was actually an angle that I used in 2020 with Adaria in the Philly and Mare turf because she did have that left-handed experience. And that was something that they were talking about before the race. She ended up winning that race. And I think that really helped her in that instance. So other than that, I also want to see what sort of ground condition have they been on? Has it been predominantly really soft turf? Have they been on firmer turf courses before? It's obviously not quite the same as what we have here. What distances are they going? 
are they even on the turf at all of the right surface that they're going to be racing on? They also have synthetic dirt horses. Uh, and then I go to those replays too. I want to see their running style, where they like to be within the race. Do they need to be on the lead? Are they going to need to be uh, closing from way back? Can they sort of have that tactical speed that's so valuable in so many races? Um, and then I would get to the relevant stats for the connection. So the trainer, the jockey, the owner, which I know is something that David Levitch said he looks at first. And I know that that's something that matters to you quite a bit. Yeah, and uh, we'll get to trainers in one moment. The one thing you didn't mention that I also, uh, and this is somewhat similar, I, I would uh, a little bit similar to the uh, configuration of the course and left and right-handed and all that. Uh, I do like to look at the weight they've carried and the horse who checks both the left-handed box and the weight box. And we're getting a little long in the tooth now, 20 years back to when High Chaparral won his first Breeders' Cup turf and then dead heated in 2003. Uh, but he actually was undefeated left handed, uh, including the Breeders' Cup wins. And that race before, so when he was a four year old before the turf at Santa Anita in 03, he had toted, I think it was 136 and then 139. And uh, that's not to say that they're going to improve necessarily at 126. I don't think that, but I do see it as a big hallmark of fitness. If they're carrying 139 in group stakes in Europe and running well, uh, you know, to me, that just there's absolutely no issue with handling the ship. And now that we will get into the conditioners, the trainers, uh, certain ones have shown that they can do it. Aiden O'Brien is uh, an electrically charged name just because he runs so many here and they do take money except the ones that don't, uh, for as poor as Aiden O'Brien's HRN Impact is, uh, because he has not won as many races as the betting public thinks. He actually is ahead with a flat bet profit, thanks to Australia, at the course that we're going to be at uh, in a couple of weeks with Keeneland. So uh, the international runners, uh, there's really no, none stick out as awful, and many have been able to win. So if someone comes over here, I kind of give the benefit of the doubt that they know what they're doing. Right. I, I feel as though if you're going to send your horse here, there's a reason for it um, and that you are sending sort of the best of the best. Uh, that may not always be the case with trainers and conditioners that have multiple horses that they could be sending over. Maybe they don't have the horse that year. Maybe they had a stronger contingent earlier in the year and then you know, things happen. But I think that it definitely is uh, a sign of confidence if they're spending the money to come all the way over here that they, they look to run well and are, are hoping for a decent result. And uh, I guess more often than not would be overselling it, but certainly their share of success. Do you have a favorite international runner who's come over here and gotten the job done? You know, not really. Um, I I really wanted to see Albar, the other horse that scratched um, mm. in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf last year, go on to do decent things and he really has not um i bet on him a couple times and uh, none of those have really been successful ventures so um i kind of i kind of followed along with him for a little while but there's no strong pet or favorite that i really have at the moment um i'm looking forward to seeing who comes over i'm really looking forward to those pre-entries in general as i know you are uh but nobody is really like on the must-see list right now right yeah i'm uh i'm with you but I think enough history is that, you know, at least one of these is going to win one of these races. And in a year where there really is no standout like Enable, I forget what price she was, but obviously favored. And, and we see these types of horses come over all the time to take money. Maybe it is a, a dangerous midge year uh, who won one of the years at, at Churchill and, and paid 20 some dollars. And they're out there, too. So that's uh, we're going to try to help some people find them, including ourselves, find them. And uh, you mentioned the pre-entries, and uh, we actually have a lot going on at Horse Racing Nation for the upcoming Breeders' Cup. Like and subscribe to know all that's going on on YouTube. But over at the Picks page, Sarah, plenty of good stuff uh, with the pre-entries coming out. And Mike Shuddy's already been hard at work. He has. We got our first sneak peek of some of the work that he's been doing to uh, get everything together for the Breeders' Cup. What's going to be in that super screener. And uh, I mean, it's really well put together. There's a lot of really valuable information in there. It's a proven winning program. And I mean, next week, I feel like we're just going to get those pre-entries and then it's like the jets are going to take off and we're just going to have a million and one things to do. And until then, I feel like it's kind of like 
the anticipation is building and building. And that's, that's why we're taking the time to highlight some of these uh, ways to look at these races that we're all going to be pouring over in the next week or so. Now, the, uh, the the big news, I really wanted to do this topic because the internationals are something everyone discusses. And in one way or the other, you kind of have to have an opinion to navigate the Breeders' Cup. But what I really want to know is, has anything changed on your Breeders' Cup Classic pick? <laughs> uh, no. I feel as though the information that we gave out in our very, very early preview of uh, both of us thinking that Flightline is the horse to be <clears throat> hasn't changed and I feel as though we've already seen the main preps for that race we had already seen them at that time uh, it seems as though no major defections have really taken place I know there's a couple horses that are going to be cross-entering different places that may or may not enter in the Breeders Cup in general I know Rich Strike is one of the ones that's still sitting yep. on the fence with that um, we'll see where some of the other possible contenders for the Breeders' Cup Classic end up, if they are going to line up in that gate to face slight line, or if they're going to try to opt for what might be an easier spot and what honestly might not be, because if they all go somewhere else, then that might not be the right. easier place to be. So um, I really think that until we get those three entries, I, I have already voiced how I feel about it. <laughs> all right. Well, we're in agreement. I will say I didn't just bring it up to Ribby a little bit because I know we we discussed it, but we are going to have some looks at uh, the, the odds and things like that going into the pre-entry period. And unfortunately, it's not too easy to find fixed odds here in the States. But I do like looking at the overseas market because it, it does give you a sense of uh, a, you can look at what internationals are taking money for the turf type races, but B, it, it still gives you a sense of what horses maybe have, have moved up in stature and, and things like that. So we're going to take a look at the the main races, you and I, and the odds and things like things like that. So encourage everyone to check that out on the main Horse Racing Nation page. The picks page is where you can get Super Screener and a bunch of other Breeders' Cup goodies. We're going to package all that together. And YouTube is where you're going to find great videos like this. So I think we're going to have it pretty well covered, Sarah. I think so, too. And while we're throwing shade at each other, I just have to bring up, I mean, what uh, needs to happen for you to have a successful winning Keeneland meet? Because it's not looking like that have, right now. I, I know you had a great Sunday, but I didn't realize it was that good because we were pretty close going into the weekend. Um, we were, the gaps started to occur Friday through Saturday and then I, mm -hmm. Sunday really pulled ahead. So yeah, I'm, I'm in that. Um, and, and I mean, you neither one of us pick all chalk. Both of us are fine. I had a very chalky Sunday. I will admit. Okay, but but yeah, we're, we're fine picking it when it makes sense. Like we don't force it one way or the other, mm -hmm. but I am in that awful spot in terms of, you know, making top picks where I'm getting the horse that pays three dollars home and nothing else and two or three of those a day is still a pretty bad day uh when you're only tallying 10 or 12 bucks against 20 so uh hopefully i'll find some of the prices and, and close the gap a little bit what are we playing for uh since since the meat is uh <laughs> well now that i'm this far done? behind i feel like we should play <laughs> for a bag of candy <laughs> you did pay your 20 bucks that was due i, I will did. i will let everyone know that you did pay your dues i don't know about the rest of those dinners that you owe but you at least no, paid those, are, so that's what matters. those are still out there we haven't we actually haven't done candy in a while so let's uh yeah so since you're losing we'll do more than a bag candy. though i mean we'll make it worth it but what ten dollars worth of candy like some good halloween candy like if you went out for a night of trick-or-treating style yeah okay we can do that. All right. It's done. It's done. As is this video. Uh, so, yes, like, subscribe, horseracingnation.com, picks.horseracingnation.com. Lots of good stuff coming up. And, of course, at Outrun the Odds and at EJXD2, up to the minute information, really, at those two places. Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> for better or worse. Mm -hmm. All right, Chief Sarah, I'm Ed. We're Horse Racing Nation, and we'll look forward to talking to you later this week.